Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Remember last week, Paul finished his letter to the church at Corinth. And, uh, and in doing so, <laughs> praise the Lord, Paul gets to leave Corn uh, Ephesus. Amen. Isn't that exciting? He's been there for a couple of months. Well, actually, he was there for, for over two years. So um, it's not quite as whatever as we kind of think. I got to find the, um, the PowerPoint myself. Hallelujah. Sermon notes. Let's find Paul. Wonder, wonder who, ba -doo -boo -poo, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Anybody know? Paul. There we go. At least I believe Paul did. Well, guys, I'm not finding it. That's my problem. That's a problem. It's, it's on there. It's out there. Actually, it's in a file. A yeah, extra folder. 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 Praise God. I was working, I was looking on my, I was on my desktop and I, you know, I forgot to put it on here. I did what I need to do. I need to unfavorite it. Let it update. Which it just did. And now put it back on favorite. So it's on my computer. There we go. We're good. We're good. We'll go, um, if you will, go to the third missionary journey, third and fourth missionary or third and fourth journeys of Paul slide. Back into the book of Acts. Amen. We're going we're to back up just a little bit because when we, we study um, Paul's third missionary journey, uh, we, we kind of go along, you know, he, in Ephesus, he, the Ephesians got baptized in the Holy Ghost. This is in Acts 18. Starting through Acts 18 through 21 is where these, these take place. He stays in Ephesus about two years, maybe closer to three, between two and three years. He wrote a first letter to the Corinthians, alluded to in 1 Corinthians. Remember that? The, one, the, the missing letter. Uh, special miracles were wrought by Paul. The sons of Sceva were whipped by a demon-possessed man. Demetrius, the Diana silversmith, stirs up the city against Paul. Um, and that is um, kind of where we kind of were the last time we were reading from Acts. Until we, and then we got into 1 Corinthians and we were there forever. I think since March sometime. It's been, it's been a while. So... Um, let me just kind of pick up in the, in the end of chapter 19, um, you kind of bring up date. Remember that Demetrius has said that they're, they're speaking against our God and saying, there's no other God. There's no gods made by the hands of men. And they had this big assembly and they were, you know, and, and, and in, um, verse 28 of chapter 19, when they heard these, the sayings, they were full of wrath and cried saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Whole city was filled with confusion, having caught Gaius and our, our, Articus, um, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. When Paul would have entered in, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. They just showed up because it was a crowd. Okay, they were just there because there was something going on. They don't even know what it was. They was just there, there. Okay, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews putting him forth, and Alexander beckoned with his hand that he would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew he was a Jew, all with one accord cried for the space of two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians. When the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how the city of, of the Ephesians is a worshiper? of the great goddess Diana and an image which fell down from Jupiter. Seeing that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought thither, hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Where if, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open. 
And there, there are deputies, let them impede, and, and plead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger. Remember, now understand, although they had uh, local rulers, they were still under Roman rule. And because they were under Roman rule, if they got out of hand, the Romans would crack down on them. In other words, they would, they would let them live at peace and run their own kind of deal as long as they stayed content, confined and kept peace and didn't rebel against Rome, they just leave them alone. But if they got out of hand, they sent in the soldiers, okay? And none of them wanted that. They just, so they kind of capitulated to, we'll just live this way as long as we can keep the soldiers from just sitting here in the garrison. Uh, we are in danger today, be, uh, called the question for today's uproar, and being no cause whereby we may give an account for this concourse. In other words, if they ask us about it, we, ain't got no, we don't have nothing to say. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Now, and after the uproar Paul, uh, was ceased, Paul called into his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. So uh, we kind of left off at the end of chapter 19 before we got into 1 Corinthians. This was kind of uh, the, the um, ending of Paul's uh, stay there. Uh, we had the big, big roundup, the big fight and all this kind of stuff. And then it says, and he departed for to go into Macedonia. Well, he was there for a while and wrote 2 Corinthians. So that's, what we, that's it for Acts. The first verse of the next chapter. Guess what? Next verse in this chapter, he writes Romans there. And so we only get the, two, the next two verses of this chapter. We're going to write going through the, two, the next two longest books in the, in the New Testament. Hallelujah. Or Paul's writings. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead, if you will, to the... Um, uh, sec it got all my, my little slide got messed up. I'm not sure how. But the, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Go to the last slide, which is on the second book of 2 Corinthians. I had that all neatened up and straight today. It was work, looking very good. Something happened. Devil on the internet. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. All right. <coughs> we do know, uh, as we said earlier, that there was probably, there was most likely four letters to the church at Corneth, in all likelihood. We, we're, we're pretty doggone sure there was three. And, and there's an illusion that might even have been a fourth. Okay? There was one before 1 Corinthians, because Paul said, I wrote before you in an epistle. Okay? In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, um, that you should not uh, company with fornicators. So he, he had already written them one letter. We don't have that letter. And so what we have is 1 Corinthians is titled that, but it could have been really 2 Corinthians. There is, in likelihood, there's some things that are kind of said in this book. There may have been one between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, so that would be 3 Corinthians. All right? Um, they may have responded to Paul's letter that we call 1 Corinthians. Um, so what I get into confusion, there's a pre-letter, there's 1 Corinthians, there's a mid-letter, and there's 2 Corinthians. Okay? So we'll just refer to the ones as pre and mid. Uh, the allusion to those that we don't have, we don't have them, so we don't, we don't have record of them. Um, but there's, and, and like we know from, from internal stuff, there was communication going back and forth between Paul and the church at Corinth. He was not happy with them. All right. And um, apparently the, the letter that they wrote back didn't go real well. So Paul, in this next letter, the, the, the second letter, uh, we, we refer to the second epistle to the church at Corinth, Paul gives a, um, explanation of why he wrote the letters or wrote the, the, the stern letter. Paul gives an explanation of, of his ministry, of his heart. Then in the middle of this, in chapters 8 and 9, he talks about the, a gift that they're supposed to be receiving. And then he finishes up uh, from 9 through 13, uh, given the authority of his apostleship. Okay? So this, so this letter is, is not as doctrinal as the first Corinthians was. It was very very specific doctrines laid out in 1 Corinthians. Uh, there's a lot of specificity given to different things in that first letter. A lot of rebuke, a lot of reproof, a lot of things are going on. In this one becomes more of Paul establishing his authority and right to say the things he has said. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and then reminds him of a gift they're supposed to be receiving. And then he wraps it up uh, with about five chapters of the authority of his apostleship. So he explains himself somewhat, and there's, you know, there's other things in here, but he, he, pretty much he's explaining himself in the first nine, uh, seven chapters of why he did what he did. 
gets it to the middle and reminds them, hey, look, now you guys have promised to take up a gift. We want to make sure that you're not going to forget about that. There's a gift to be taken up. And, and there's some good things in those two chapters. And then he comes back and he just let, flat out lays out his authority as an apostle. Okay? All right. And when you're dealing with people who are rebellious, people who want to do it their way, people who, you know, um, you know sometimes you just got to lay down the law that this, I have the authority to do this. And that's what Paul did. Okay. First Corinthians, I mean, Second Corinthians, chapter two. I'm sorry, chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, and all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, the first two verses, the first two, three verses, are, are pretty much a standard opening of Paul in some form or another. You know, he, has, he, he declares he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, okay? Um, and so, and then, he, he'll, then he'll move out of there, he'll say, and then he begins to move into some other things. For as, I, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth. By Christ. Whether we be afflicted is for your con consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Paul's saying, whether we're suffering or whatever, it's for your good. Okay? And our hope of you is steadfast. Now, say, now Paul said, hey, our hope for, of you is, is steadfast. We, we believe, let me say this, kind of paraphrase this. In the, I, I honestly believe it's going to all work out okay. You guys are going to get it together. Okay? That's what Paul said. Now, Paul didn't just kind of go, I believe you're all going to get it together and walk away. He said, I believe you're going to get it together, and here's why you're going to get it together. So I'm going to slam you. <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. I'm going to clean your clock and love you at the same time. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the suffering, so shall you also be of the consolation. For we would, brethren, have you not ignorant of our trouble, which we came, that came unto us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, inasmuch as we despaired even of life. In other words, they, they, were, they were in fear of their lives at several times. They went through a bunch of stuff. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. Now, they're, they're saying we, we face death a lot. We're trusting God to bring us out. We trust God all the time. Somebody say amen. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have, con we have our conversation or our lifestyle in the world and more abundantly toward you. For we write none other things unto you than what we, you read or acknowledge, and I trust even shall acknowledge even to the end. And Paul's saying, but basically Paul's saying, like, you, you know what we're telling, saying is the truth, and I trust you'll continue to hold fast to that, not just waver. Because remember, they, they kept having people come in and try to stir up problems. As also you have acknowledged us in part that we are, we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. And to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto you uh, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or the things that I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. Now Paul was saying, I planned on coming through there on my way to Macedonia and coming back through there on my way back. You'll find out later he says he didn't do that. He, he began to, he changed his mind on that. But as God is true, verse 18, and our word toward you is not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among us by you, even by me, Silvanus and Timotheus. Was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all of now, this is a great scripture. But Paul's saying I wasn't double toned. I did, I was straight up. I didn't back off. I didn't I didn't change things. I didn't you know I was straight with you that what, of what I was planning on doing. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, and to the glory of God by us. Or as Weymouth says, all the promises of God have the yes in him. 
Amen? And our amen acknowledges the truth of it to the glory of God in us. Now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you, I came not as yet under corn. You see, Paul's saying, look, um, I didn't come because there was still too much contention. Okay? Not for that we have a dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, and by faith you stand. But I determined this was not myself, um, this with myself, that I would not have come unto, again unto you in heaviness. For if I make you sorrow, who is sorry, who is glad, who is he that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? Now Paul says, you're still upset with me, and I'm not going to come through there right now because it's going to be a mess. That's what he's saying. And so I, I didn't come through there because I didn't want to keep this thing stirred up. All right? So that's why, that's, now understand now, in 2 um, Corinthians, in Acts chapter 20, verse 1, he went to Macedonia. He's telling the church of Corinth, I had planned on coming through you to get to Macedonia. And now he's explaining why he didn't do that. That was his plans, but he didn't do it because they were still upset with him. And apparently that, that in-between letter that we don't have accounted for that. They were still upset with him. They didn't like the fact he came down so hard on them. He didn't like the fact that he, he just said, put that guy out of the church. They didn't like the fact he told them to stop fornicating. They didn't like any of that stuff. And they rebelled against it. You know? I got the Holy Ghost too. Try that. Just try the Miriam and Aaron thing and see what, how, how that works out for you. Hello? Come on now. I hear from heaven too. Go ahead on. Maybe this is the old saying we have. If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. Amen. You can learn what you can just learn from Miriam and Aaron and not get in trouble to start with. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. So Paul says, um, if I've made you sorry, and I'm and you're the one that makes me glad, amen. Then if I come and it's not you're not gonna make me glad, it's not gonna be a good thing. And I wrote the same unto you, lest when I should come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart. Now see, Paul begins to bear that I wasn't just being hard on you just to be hard on you. It's difficult for me to do this. It was difficult for me to bring this discipline. It's difficult for me to say the things I said in 1 Corinthians. Well, it wasn't that I took pleasure in it, and I was just, man, could not wait to fillet you and put you on the grill. He said, with much, with much uh, affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love with which I more abundantly I have more abundantly unto. Let's stop here for a second. Well, if any have, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Now remember, he's making reference now to the man that was put out of the church for shacking up with his stepmama. So we, we see stuff there and go, man, that ain't never heard that. Oh, it's, ha it's happened before. Whatever you hear, whatever perversion you hear, whatever garbage you hear, it's happened before. All right? This man was living with a stepmom, and Paul said, put him out of the church, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, and his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And um, Paul said he did not do that to cause grief. Hello? He hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not ever charge you all. Sufficient to such a man is his punishment uh, or censure, which was inflicted of many. Okay. Now, he's going to go in here and talk about some other things about this man in a second. But let me say this. The Apostle Paul exercised church discipline for the sake of the church and for the man. Remember, he said he was going to turn his spirit over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. But he's also exercised it so that the church would not continue to condone this activity and act like it was okay, right in the middle of them. Well, there's examples in the Old Testament of things. Remember um, the person, when they were told not to take anything from the enemies they captured, and one of the, one of the families took and buried in their tent a treasure from the, from the uh, conquest. And it brought a curse on the whole nation. Because they had disobeyed God. And so Paul exercised the discipline to save the man's eternal spirit, but at the same time to bring 
uh, to save the church from, from um, um, judgment, as it were, in, in their midst. He loved them. But you see, I'm going to tell you, 95% of the time when, when you bring, if you're an authority and you bring judgment or you bring uh, a, 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 a judgment or you bring a, not punishment, correction, it doesn't go well. People don't like it. They get mad with you. They get peeved with you. You know, 95% of the time they'll leave the church. Because there's another church down the road that you could say, well, listen, they left our church and they did such, 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 and they'll just take them right in and want to think twice about it. Now, it used to be, at least when churches were working together, that if you're, especially if you're the same denomination, if, you, if they left your church, went down the road, and they, that pastor would call you and say, listen, so and so, well, you know, they left, that, that pastor would say, you go back there and get that straight. You can't come here until you get that straight. You're not coming in here. You're going to get that straight. You're not going to bring your strife from there over to here. That's how it used to be. That doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work that way anymore because people don't do that. Um, we can fix them. No, if, 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 they, if they take it with them, it's going to go with them. All right. Where was I here? In this a chapter. Y'all remember where I was? Okay. I'm in chapter two, aren't I? <laughs> I keep looking back over to chapter 1. All right, sufficient to a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrawise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Now, in other words, what's happened here is this guy has gotten sor sorrowful. The censure of the church has brought into his senses, basically. Now, Paul's saying, let up now. The, what, we, what we intended is taking place. He's overwhelmed with sorrow. <clears throat> wherefore I, can, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him for this to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether you will be obedient and well, whether you be obedient and all things Now Paul said one of the things he wrote that, that sent that for was to find out if they're going to obey to whom you forgive anything I forgive also for if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and open doors unto me, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God. Now, well, thanks be unto God. now he's writing this letter from Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, and but in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Now Paul's saying there are people speaking with lack of insincerity and corrupt the word of God. And it goes on in the church today. Because it's, it's, it's about... Uh, the gain, greed, greedy, filthy gain of filthy lucre. They'll manipulate the word of God to their own, for their own good, etc. Okay. Now Paul begins to give a, uh, in the first five verses of this next chapter, an accreditation of his ministry. Do we begin to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are for, for sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now, he'll spend the rest of this chapter talking about the spiritual and gloriousness of the ministry he's called to. Who have also made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but the letter for the letter killeth, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. But the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. Now think about that. He's saying that the Old Testament law was so glorious 
that when that Moses came down after seeing it, had to cover his face. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather or more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, it, it doesn't even compare to the glory of the New Testament. In other words, the New Covenant, the, the righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus, the, the, the Old Testament righteousness doesn't even compare to how glorious it is. Seeing that we have such a hope, we have great plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which had put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, and for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Nevertheless, when it shall turn, when, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Don't take that out of context. I have had people take that verse and run off and say, oh, what a spirit of the Lord, there's liberty, and they can, be, they can do anything they want to do. That is not what it means. That's just garbage. Amen. We're free. We're liberated, but we're not liberated to do whatever we want to do. We're liberated to follow Christ. We're liberated to walk in the, glory, the, 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 the greater glory of the new covenant. We're liberated from sin. We're liberated from the bondage and control and domination of sin and of the flesh. But you're not liberated to do whatever you want to do. That's just a lie of the devil. In other words, if Satan can't keep you out of something, he'll try to push you over into something. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are listen, wait, see, now listen, the liberty, but listen, we're, we're beholding the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Go find me a scripture where Jesus did whatever he wanted to do. Came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. That which the works that I do, the Father in me, he doeth the works. Everything Jesus was about was honoring and representing the Father. Hebrews starts out saying he being the, out, the, the brightness or the outshining or outraying of his glory. He reflected the Father. He told Philip, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Hello? Thus... When we're talking about these things, looking the hole in the glass, we're talking about being free. We're free to, to, to go out and do the will of God and be a reflection of the will and purpose of God on the earth. Not to do whatever our flesh wants to do. Chapter 4. Paul goes on and begins to start talking about the honesty and the suffering he went through. Okay? How honesty is innocent. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty or shame, the Greek says. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Now, folks, there are people who deliberately handle the word of God deceitfully. They teach things that puts money in their pocket. That sells their books, that sells their... There are their electronic media versions of, of tape. And this, I don't have anything wrong with it because we do it. I mean, well, actually, we give ours away now. We give all of ours away. We don't, we don't I mean, if you go buy one, we, we, we basically charge to cover the cost of somebody doing it. And we don't charge you $20 for a tape or a CD. We're get, you know, we're, we put it all on the Internet for everybody to get. We're not, you know. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I can't argue with somebody saying, you know, this helps support our ministry. This, this helps us raise money so we can go do some of the things we do. I, I get that. I'm just saying there are those who simply just handle the word of God deceitfully in order to gain an advantage and get money so they can just go do whatever they want to do. They're not handling it right. They're handling it with deceit. Okay? So he says here, um, do, 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 do. Hallelujah. We have, uh, but we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not, ourself, but preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves servants for, your, for Jesus' sake. So Paul's saying that these things are plain, these things are clear, and if they're hid, they're hid to the lost. Because Satan has blinded their minds. 
Because we're not preaching about us. We're preaching Jesus. Amen. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, had signed into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, if, you don't, if, they're, if they're blinded, they're lost. If they're, not, if they're not blinded, it's because God's shining his light on you, the revelation, the light of his glory onto you, so that you see and understand. Amen. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, see, we're, we're, we're earthen vessels. We carry about this, but it's still any of the glory, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, all the works that are done are done because of the power and the glory of God, not because we're great. Because we're just like everybody else in the flesh. We're earthen vessels. Paul goes on and says this. We are troubled on every side, yet not, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. One translation says knocked down, but not knocked out. Hallelujah. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus. In other words, they, they were constantly facing persecution and death. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now, the spirit of faith is you believe and you speak. Now, we're not teaching on faith tonight on, on this line. We're just kind of we're going through here. And Paul's defending his ministry. But he'll, he'll, he puts these statements in here that are world life changers. Amen? These are things that just radically change your life when you come to a revelation that the spirit of faith can be, can be imparted in us. We believe, therefore we speak. In other words, we speak what we believe because we have a spirit of faith about us. Hallelujah. Knowing that he which was raised up, who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many. We thank God for what he's doing. Amen. We thank God that the Lord Jesus was raised up by God the Father. And he's going to raise us up also. Amen. I mean, you don't have, a, you know, that teaching was out, uh, what well, was it 20 years ago? The manifest of sons of God, 25, 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, kingdom now teaching was just is really a rehash of the manifest sons of God. They were all going, you know, there's going to be a certain, elect, people are going to get to a certain level on the earth. They're going to become the manifest sons of God. They'll walk through walls and do all the, you know, no, nah, nah, you get that when Jesus comes back. Not before. Hello. I said not before. Hallelujah. For, though, for, for which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment work for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal or subject to change, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now Paul says, look, we, we've gone through some stuff, and we've done these things on your, for your behalf. <clears throat> we suffer from, through some things so we can give you the gospel. My ministry is as a ministry of honesty. I've suffered some stuff, but it was for your sake. In other words, I'm doing this because I'm called to do that, to minister to you. And I put up with a bunch of garbage to be able to do that. But I'm going to, I'll just keep putting up with the garbage because it's a light affliction. It's just for, for a moment. Hallelujah. Are you here? And I'm not even going to look at the things which I say. I'm going to look at the unseen. Because the, the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hallelujah. Where are we here? Praise God. I got, we're moving along. See, I, I told you the cadence in, of this letter and, and, and the, and the um, things in this letter are different from 1 Corinthians. See, we, there were so many corrections and doctrines and stuff that he did in the first one that we had to kind of, kind of keep stopping and going. This is more of an explanation Paul's doing here of why he's done what he's done. Okay? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, Remember I told you last week, or Sunday, that we're not going to get back this body when Jesus comes back. We get a different one. 
This will be sown in corruption. We'll be raised in incorruption. This is mortal. We'll have an immortal. Amen. We're desiring for the heavenly. We're, to be, we're desiring to be released from the earthly and, 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 and clothed in the heavenly. In other words, a glorified body like Jesus has. Woo, glory. Amen. It's so that, we, that being clothed, we should not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for the, that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So he's saying, Paul's going on to begin to talk here about <clears throat> that desire we had to be free from the limitations of a mortal death doom in a corruptible body and, it, and the dictates and the appetites it has all the time and be clothed upon, not unclothed, but clothed upon with the glorified heavenly body. Amen. Now he that wrought for us the self same thing as God who also given, has given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Therefore, we're always confident knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. See, now that is a scripture we use all the time. But here Paul is in the, the context. Paul's saying that living in this body, separated from the Lord in that sense of you can't just, you know, get out of your body, hang out with the Lord. Y'all sit around and, you know, and, and drink tea or whatever. You know, um, we have to walk by faith and not by sight. We don't, we don't see the Lord every day. Maybe, so most people will go their whole life on this earth in this body and never see Jesus. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now, when, you, when you're clothed upon, you'll see him. John says, we'll see him at what will be as he is. We'll see him as he is. Okay? It won't be a faith walk. You'll just step over there. Amen. Now, he that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, eight. We are confident, I say, and, whether, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Now, in other words, Paul, Paul's saying, man, you're kind of getting the idea of this thing. It'd be, it's just great to be with the Lord. Get out of this body and go hang out with Jesus. Wherefore we labor that present, th listen to this, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And that's counter to, counter to a lot of the grace teaching, the extreme, radical, out of balance grace teaching. You don't do anything, you're under grace. Paul says we labor. That whether we're present in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the presence of the Lord, remember, to be, to be in the body is to be absent from the Lord. Amen? That to be home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Paul says whether we're absent or present with the Lord, we labor to be accepted of him. We labor. L-A-B-O-U-R, old English. We labor. Let me put it in modern English. W-O-R-K. Ah, nice works. Ah, well, Paul labored. Whether he was in his body or out of his body, he labored to be accepted of the Lord. For we all, listen, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. It don't matter what you do. Paul said it did. You're going to get judged for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can I get an amen? Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive of the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it's good or bad. In your body, B-O-D-Y. Hello. And then you got boneheads running around saying it don't matter what we do because we're under grace. We're spirits anyway. Read your whole Bible. I, I just, be, be a Berean. Study the scriptures. See whether those things be so or not. Amen. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I get drunk or get high. It doesn't matter if I run around. It don't matter. That's my body, and I'm under grace. Well, Paul said that you're going to be judged for it. What you do in your body, you're going to be judged for it. He didn't say we'd be judged. You're going to the judgment seat of Christ. What do you call it? Come on now. Y'all hear you going home. <clears throat> he said we're going to receive the things we did in our body. That's the law of seed time and harvest. You don't want to sow a bunch of bad seed and then show up in front of Jesus. Try telling him it doesn't matter. Get up to the judgment seat of Christ. Say, hey, Lord, you know what? It just doesn't matter. I'm under grace. And you might hear him say, did you not read what I told my 
Apostle Paul in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, down in the uh, 10th verse, that you would appear before my seat and receive of what you did in your body? The Lord wouldn't do that. He loves us. I'm going to sit over on the sideline and see how that worked out for you. Don't be foolish. God's not angry, now, but he's telling you there are principles in the Word of God. We have to follow those principles. Amen. Paul said, I labor to be accepted of him. Amen. I labor. Hello? Listen to this next verse. That's it. He said, whether it's good or bad. You're going to receive whether it's good or bad. Let's make sure it's good. And repent for the bad. We don't repent anymore. Where did you get that from? Just because some preacher says it don't mean the Bible's... When preach, the preacher's been doing this for millennia, saying that doesn't apply and this doesn't this. If it's in there, it's in there. Just follow the Bible and don't believe it if they say it's not. Let's look at verse 11. God's only good. He never, he, God will never judge me. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. So, and they say, come back to these people who are using the word of God deceitfully. They've come, they've... I've been accused of so many things in my ministry. One thing that people do not like is I will not back off the truth and tell you this is what the Bible says, and I won't, and I won't placate to your flesh so that you can do what you want to do and get away with it and feel good while you do it. Do you know why? I have to answer to God for your soul. I have a responsibility to tell you the truth from the Word and say what the Word says. And if you think it's okay to cater to your flesh, I will not condone that in your life and tell you it's okay. Just to keep your tithe and to keep you coming and to keep you happy. And so you'll buy my tapes. You can tell how old I am. I keep calling them tapes. My thumb drives. All right? My downloadable MP3s. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have someone to answer them that appear, that which glory in appearance. In other words, there are people coming in there making themselves out there somebody. Let me tell you something, folks. There are people who can come, and they can dress it, and they can have all, the, all of this, and they can have all of that, and they can have all the things put together and look like they really know what they're talking about and be a shyster. <coughs> Sent there an emissary of the devil. Sent to bring disruption to the kingdom of God. And they're doing it for the, for the gain of filthy lucre. Paul said, I did not handle the word of God deceitfully. He's, he's referring, and here he's alluding back to the, there are those who do. <coughs> They'll tell you what you want to hear and have big meetings and all this kind of stuff to get all your money. And then just, paint, just, just, just pump you up with this and that and tell you it doesn't matter and all kinds of stuff and all they're doing is they're reaching into your pocketbook. Now, at the same time that Satan is motivating to do that and they reach into your pocketbook, they're taking it out of the local church. It's a plan of Satan. Paul says, uh, says so they, they glory in appearance but not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we're sober, it is for your cause. For the love of God constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. And when he died for all, that they should, which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Listen to this. And, when the, and that he died for all, they, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Come on, church. Live unto themselves. What's it saying? You no longer had the right to live the way you want to live. You have to live in a way that pleases God. That's what he just said. 
but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wow. In other words, your obligation is no longer, is, you did not get set free from Satan's hold on your life so you can go do whatever you want to do. You got set free from Satan's hold on your life. Jesus died for you, was raised up. And now that you've been raised up, you should live for him. Your objective and your thought processes and the way you conduct yourself should be to honor and to glorify God. Not, can I get away with this? Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Then comes one of the most famous passages of scriptures in the charismatic church. We've used this for decades. It's the beginning of our in him realities. And it's a powerful set of scriptures. Therefore, what? Based on the fact that Jesus died for you, you've been raised up, you're going to live your life for him. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. Now, we know he's talking about your spirit. Can't be talking about your body, because if you came down to the altar, and you weigh 276 pounds, unless you cry a lot, you're going to weigh 276 pounds when you leave. Maybe 275. Okay? You're going to look the same way. We ain't going to go, oh, I don't know that. Who was that person that came out of the prayer room? Came in here, lost, came into the prayer room, and came out looking like, you know, a, 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 a runway model for somebody. You know, your flesh stays the same. You still know who you are. You know your address. You know where you came from. You know who your mama is. So your mind didn't get saved. What got, your spirit got born again. Therefore, you know, Paul prayed to the church at Thessalonica. We, we read this earlier in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. So Paul says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, what's in Christ? Your spirit. Our bodies, he tells us in Romans chapter 12 to renew our minds to the word of God. We found out in Ephesians, the first chapter, that our bodies had the seal of the Holy Spirit as a promise on the purchase redemption. That is what? That we're going to get a glorified body. So if, but what is in Christ is the spirit of man became a new creature in Christ. He was born again. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Jesus said in John, the third chapter, he said that a man must be born again. Nicodemus says, can I crawl up to my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, you, are you a teacher of Israel? Don't understand. He said that which is more of the flesh is flesh, and that which is more of the spirit is spirit. You have to have a physical birth, and then you have to have a spiritual birth, born again by the spirit of God. And we say born again, that can actually translate born anew. Okay? And all things are of God who reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, and that's old King Jimmy for to know, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed, now listen to this, God's in the world not imputing their trespasses unto them, but he, people will go to hell because they reject Jesus Christ. That think. Remember something interesting the book of Revelation says, and whose names, were not, who, whose names were not blotted out of the land's book of life. Now, we used to sing an old song in my Pentecostal church. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Your name was not written down in glory the day you got saved. Everybody's name got written down in the book of glory when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and paid the price for man's sin. Those who die without him get blotted out. And everybody say, wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Mom, there you go. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's committed unto us to reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him sin. The words to be are, not, are italicized. They're not in the Greek, so we're just going to read it the way it was in the Greek. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. Amen. So here we have Apostle Paul giving an account of his ministry, talking about why he did certain things, the reason for it, um, talking about the, you know, the spirituality of things that were, that were spirit beings, that we're not to live after the flesh, we're to live after the spirit. Amen? And we'll get into the next, uh, next two chapters. He gives more um, accounts of the credibility or the authority of his ministry uh, and, and why he did the things he did. Hallelujah. But 
Notice that Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. But I, I like this. He said just a little bit before that, where he talked about um, in verse 15, that he which died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. You no longer have the right to live unto yourself. And can I say this with, with, with all sincerity? And you shouldn't want to. There should be such a gratefulness to God. Just like um, the woman who came and washed Jesus' feet with her hair, with her tears, and dried them with her hair, and put ointment on them, to much, who much is forgiven. Amen? There, there's much love out of those who get forgiven, you know, who get forgiven much. She's washing his feet, and, and the Pharisees are getting mad. If he was the son of God, if he was a prophet, he would know who this woman is. I know who she is. But she was so grateful that the Lord delivered her. And I think there are messages brought to the church by emissaries of the enemy to thwart a grateful heart as an instrument of the enemy to make us self-serving and self-seeking instead of having a grateful heart and henceforth living not unto ourselves, but unto him. That's what we should be doing. Not living for ourselves, living unto him. Can you say amen? Next week we'll pick up chapter 7. Probably get through chapter 7 and 8. Uh, chapters, I mean, ch uh, chapter 6, 6 and 7. Probably the following we'll get into 8 and 9. Because those are, those are two powerful uh, chapters on giving. And, and um, it was about giving a gift. But there's a lot of stuff that Paul says in there that's powerful. We've covered it before in the past. But we're going to cover it in this, con this context of what he's doing. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fvc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.